Thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful celebration. Uh, Nimbus, of course, is uh, very dear to me because I began my professional career here in 1966 with the Nimbus program. And uh, a lot of people in the Nimbus program, like uh, Bill Nordberg, Harry Press, Bill Bandine, and others, were professional fathers to me. And I, I grew up with Nimbus. And uh, it was exciting in Nimbus and NASA, especially NASA Goddard, uh, as well as my own organization, ESA, which is not an oil company, it was the, the old NOAA, um, gave me lots of opportunities as a, as a young scientist. So I thank everyone for that. Um, the, uh, of course, the Nimbus program, as has been mentioned earlier, is uh, instrumental in flying the, uh, whoops, did I do something wrong here? Yeah. Uh, instrumental in flying the uh, very first instruments uh, for atmospheric sounding on the Nimbus uh, 3 satellite. And um, uh, that, as you'll see, has turned out to absolutely revolutionize weather forecasting as we know it today. It began with uh, these instruments. And uh, this is sort of a chronology of the sounding milestones in the Nimbus program, but I want to point out uh, Nimbus uh, B here, which was the one mentioned earlier that fell into the drink, was a launch failure. And uh, what happened remarkably as a result of that was that the Nimbus program under Harry Press uh, decided that, hey, this is so important that we can't, we got to get Nimbus B up there as soon as we can. And they vowed to get a Nimbus replacement, Nimbus B2, up there in less than a year from the date it was launched, which was in May of uh, 1968. And sure enough, this is something that couldn't be done today, but 11 months later, in April of, uh, of 1969, uh, Nimbus B-2, which became, of course, in orbit, Nimbus 3, was launched successfully. And that was the beginning of the satellite sounding program uh, in space. And um, now, there are a lot of, lot of pioneers uh, that I, I have on this chart here. I'm not going to go into all of them. But, uh, of course, for this lecture, most not notably were these two guys, uh, David Wark, Dr. David Wark, who was with this organization, ESA, and, uh, of course, Rudolf Hanel, who flew all these instruments to more planets than anybody else, uh, uh, also had an instrument on the Nimbus 3 spacecraft. Uh, the WARC instrument was a grading spectrometer. It measured the, uh, the radiation at eight optimally defined wavelengths to observe atmospheric temperature profiling. And uh, uh, from the window region all the way to the center of a absorption band due to CO2, which allowed you to relate this spectral variation of radiance to the temperature variation in the atmosphere. If I turn that slide sideways, you would see the temperature profile of the atmosphere being warm near the surface, going to a minimum at the tropopause, and then increasing again, going higher in the atmosphere. And that was the concept. Rudy Hano flew this interferometer, uh, which measured many spectral channels, hundreds of spectral channels compared to just those eight. At that time, we didn't realize how valuable that was. Today, we're flying these kinds of instruments on our operational satellites, as I'll show you in a moment. And, uh, but these two gentlemen, uh, Rudy, who's shown here, he's still with us. He was at the 45th anniversary. I'm sorry he didn't make it to this one. And his IRIS instrument. And, um, whoops, whoops, where'd it go? David Wark, uh, who passed away some time ago, but uh, with his uh, Sears instrument, uh, which uh, provided the very first atmospheric temperature sounding back in, uh, on, the, on the launch day of 1969, April 14th, as compared to a balloon sound. And you can see it was very close agreement, which gave everybody uh, a lot of excitement. Now, here's something that's, that's really quite interesting. Uh, Hal Wolf worked for the National Meteorological Center with me on producing a, the... Uh, um, algorithm and the, and the software to process the Sears data. And uh, of course on launch day, Ralph Shapiro, who was running the ground station, uh, I was pestering him, I think I was in the ground station all the time watching the data come out on the strip recorders and 
uh, couldn't wait to get my hands on the data, provided us with tapes of the data for the entire day of that first day. And uh, Hal Wolf of NMC and I stayed up all night that, that very first night and uh, processed these data and hand plotted these data, these sounding data on a, uh, on a chart and hand analyzed them, contour analysis. And we got very excited about what we saw so the very next morning, about 8 o'clock in the morning, right after the director of NMC, the National Meteorological Center, got in his office, we were there waiting for him. That was Fred Schumann, and said, we got some exciting results to show you. And he was kind of a skeptic, you know, that you could sound the atmosphere from space. And he says, okay, let me call my deputies. He called uh, Ed Fawcett, his uh, uh, deputy, and uh, Harlan Saylor, his director of operations, in uh, to look at these maps that we created. And Harlan Saylor was really a skeptic. He used to needle me on, why am I wasting my time kind of on this business? Uh, but uh, he, he says, let me see those charts. So he, he took those charts and took a look at them, you know. And uh, he, he looked at them and looked, stared at them. And he went right to one position, ran his finger down there. And he goes, oh my god. And I said, oh, what's wrong? He says, well, he says, we've been taking a lot of flack from the airlines, getting calls overnight on our, our bad weather forecasts. We mispositioned the jet stream, and the airlines were flying into headwinds and had to stop, you know, midway to refuel. It's costing them a lot of money. And here I see that you, that Sears, the Nimbus satellite, properly positioned that jet stream. And then he went on to say, he said, uh, um, uh, when can you make this operational? This is the very first day, the day after the launch. <laughs> and of course, my, my naivety and youth and so on said, oh, we can do it in about six weeks. <laughs> and uh, he says, great. He says, let's, let's do it. And uh, uh, so uh, we are committed to do that. And through Ralph, Ralph Shapiro, who was running the ground station, he played a big role in being able to get the digital data to us from Nimbus on a routine basis. And we started with a carrier transporting tapes from the ground station to Suitland uh, on a, almost on an orbital basis uh, to make this happen. And that started on May 22nd, less than six weeks after, after launch. And that was in time for the National Meteorological Center to get these uh, data into their final analysis, which was used for weather forecasting. And, um, uh, it was quite an achievement. And this just shows an example of one test of how these data were improving weather forecasts for the U.S. This is data over the Pacific, the mid-Pacific, where the uh, Nimbus data showed a, uh, a cutoff low. You see this low up here and then another low to the south. This is cut off from the one to the north, whereas the analysis without the satellite data didn't show that at all. It's just a diffuse trough. And that made a huge difference Oops, I lost a slide there. No. That made a huge difference for the forecast for the western United States three days later. This is a three-day forecast, and you see that this is the verifying analysis, and you can see that with the Nimbus data, it correctly forecasts the shortwave ridge uh, over the western United States, which was not forecast without the Nimbus data. And uh, in fact, the errors were, were uh, uh, more than twice as great without the data than with the data in the forecast errors. Of course, that leads to precipitation forecast errors and everything else. Um, but the satellite data wasn't perfect by any means. These instruments, Sears and Iris, had large fields of view, so a lot of cloud contamination, and the cloudy soundings, quite frankly, were pretty poor compared to the clear air soundings. So that problem had to be dealt with. So on Nimbus 5 and Nimbus 6, we flew different kind of instruments. They were multispectral radiometers rather than these uh, grading and, and interferometer spectrometers, but they had the characteristic of being very high spatial resolution, 20 kilometers compared to 150 kilometers, and that pretty much solved the pro cloud problem in the infrared. We were able to look through uh, breaks in the clouds and, and uh, uh, see lots of clear, clear sky, and so the yield and the accuracy of the soundings got much, much better with these instruments. And then uh, we also flew microwave instruments on Nimbus 5 and 6, which were able to uh, go through cloud. 
The other thing that happened was in 1998, we flew an, uh, an advanced microwave sounding unit, which added a lot of spectral channels of temperature and water vapor in the microwave. And this uh, really advanced sounding accuracy quite a bit as well. And uh, so we see here where the temperature accuracy is getting down to, to in, in the one and a half degree level here from uh, two and a half to three degrees uh, before that. And uh, the, the problem, though, with these soundings, uh, with the early Nimbus soundings and even these soundings uh, with the advanced microwave system is uh, the lack of vertical resolution. Because the uh, energy comes from such a deep layer of the atmosphere, the soundings from the satellite were very smooth compared to the detailed structure that exists due to fronts and the tropopause and so on that's measured by a balloon. So something had to be done to alleviate this uh, 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 vertical resolution deficiency. So that began, we, in the mid-1980s, uh, uh, supported by the EOS program, and I'll give Shelby Telford uh, a lot of credit for supporting our work in this area, we developed the methodology of hyperspectral sounding. Instead of having just a couple dozen of channels for sounding the atmosphere, we observed the whole spectrum with high resolution, very high resolution, like shown here. Thousands of spectral channels, which uh, together uh, with the, the large number of channels, together with the uh, details of the spectrum that are measured here, led to a big increase, improvement in vertical resolving power. It wasn't that the weighting functions or the resolution of a single measurement was all that much better than the older instruments, the fact that you had thousands of these channels, that when you put it in the retrieval system, you had very high signal to noise ratio for this deconvolution process of transforming radiance in the atmospheric profiles. And this led to a factor of three to four improvement in the vertical resolution of these uh, soundings. In fact, the uh, the hyperspectral sounding information content, as was shown from real data, once we started flying these, these instruments, uh, like on the, uh, the AIRS instrument, on the AQUA satellite, and the IAZI instrument, on the uh, MEDOP satellite, and now the CRIS instrument on the SMPP satellite, uh, showed this uh, 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 much greater improvement, three to four times higher information content than these old multispectral instruments and almost as much information as the radioson. And so this has led to a dramatic improvement in weather forecasting uh, as shown here by ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Prediction, where they show that the satellite sounding systems, the microwave and the hyperspectral infrared, are the biggest contributors to the weather forecast now much greater than, say, the radio sun. In other words, the forecast accuracy degrades the most if you exclude these, these instruments from it. And uh, to go on further, that when you look at single instruments, individual microwave and, and hyperspectral instruments, the hyperspectral infrared instruments are way beyond the capability of the uh, other data sources for improving the weather forecast. In fact, the single most important instrument in today's operation is the MEDOP IOSI, which has almost 9,000 spectral channels to it. And uh, a practical example of this was the Superstorm Hurricane Sandy prediction. You remember that, October of 2012, which landfalled in New Jersey and just devastated the Northeast Coast. And uh, this was a, a five-day forecast by the European Center using all the data, including all the hyperspectral sounding data, and of course, every other observation that goes into the global observing system. And that forecast was spot on at five days out with what actually occurred, which is this verifying analysis. When they took out the satellite sounding data, this was the forecast. It never even made landfall. And uh, so you can see that uh, the uh, satellite data playing a very dramatic role for improving uh, uh, not only weather prediction, but uh, severe storm prediction, such as the hurricane forecast. 
And the next observing system, what the WML calls the uh, space component for 2025, is going to have at least nine of these hyperspectral sounders in orbit. It's going to have uh, six of them, at least six, on geostationary satellites around the globe. And we're going to have at least three of these in, in orbits in complementary orbital planes on the, on the polar uh, system. And uh, so uh, thank you for uh, your attention and, and bearing through the, uh, the problem with the, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides. But uh, I hope the presentation gave, gave you a, a, the sense the, that the Nimbus satellite program really did initiate the revolutionary advances achieved in weather forecasting that we enjoy today. Thank you very much for your attention.